Good morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you're watching this. Uh, we're going to finish Chapter 5, which uh, is looking at privacy. So we left off talking about personal data, and we're going to pick up with that information. And essentially, one of the big issues that we're dealing with today is the fact that collecting personal information has become an industry. Companies collect searches and purchasing patterns to then sell to advertisers and companies to directly market specific ads to a profile. So if you are searching on Google for the latest video game cart system or you're looking for a certain kind of music on iTunes, all of that gets collected and stored. These companies will then turn around and sell that information to other companies who want to sell you things. So the example that I have on the screen is when you use a loyalty card at a local store and I have in my Acme Super card sitting there looking at you, all of your purchases are tracked and then companies can sell your buying profile to companies that would like to be their customers. You would like to be their customers. So for example, I tend to buy a lot of coffee on my Acme Supercard. So I'm always getting offers from Acme to buy one, get one free with coffee. Anyone who uses the internet has a digital footprint and we're going to look at how people are tracked. The most popular way is a cookie. And these are small little data files that are written and stored on the user's hard disk driven by a website. By a website. They contain information such as passwords, pa pages that you have visited on the website, and the dates you have visited the site. So when you log into Amazon, they know what you have looked at previously, so they tend to show you products that they think you would be interested in based upon previous viewing history. So for example, I spent quite a bit of time over the past month looking at ukuleles on Amazon so I could buy one for my nephew for his birthday. Now, every time I open up Amazon, I am being shown a dozen different kinds of ukuleles. So, in one sense, it's great if I'm still shopping, but it's kind of a pain in the butt if I'm done shopping. The next kind is called a third-party cookie, and this is what gets people all upset. Cookies that are placed across a network of related sites so that a user's movements are tracked not only on a certain site, but also within any site affiliated with the network of sites. DoubleClick, which is owned by Google, is the most um, popular one of these third-party cookie sites. They allow Google to provide customized ads whenever a user goes on an affiliated DoubleClick site. So, for example, if I'm advertising on Google and I'm trying to sell French bread, if someone is looking for a vacation in Paris, my advertisement sh might show up for them because of keywords. That's really the key on how Google is making a ton of money, is they are able to tailor ads, not just for a certain demographic, but for you specifically. The last one is not so well known, and these are called beacons. These are small pieces of software code that are installed on a user's computer and that can track a web surfer's location and online activities. This is used to build databases about customers and when then they are sold to advertisers. Again, this is all about the making of money, and you'll see a little beacon tracker um, picture on the right hand side of the screen. So how do they make all their money? So here's the my my example from Soup to Nuts. So you go on Amazon to buy your mom a Mother's Day gift. Oh, you're so nice. You end up looking at a dozen different sweaters before you settle on the lilac turtleneck, which you see on the right. The next time you log in, you may find your screen filled with pastel sweaters and skirts that would match the lilac turtleneck. You may even see an advertisement for some event where a person could wear their new lilac turtleneck. This collection of information about you has literally made it easier for a company to personalize marketing directly for you and your needs. Previously, most marketing was done based on a demographic. Your African American, or your Asian, or your Hispanic, or your white, your gender, boy or girl, and whether or not you are 18 to 25, 25 to 39, 40 to 50, and so on and so forth. 
now they can actually customize the marketing directly to a particular person. Now how do we stop companies from doing this? There are two legal options. One, companies must inform consumers about how their data is being used. Second, co consumers would have to give their permission for a company to use their data. That seems pretty simple. We give permission, they tell us, there's a problem now. The default settings for our operating systems and our browsers usually are set to accept cookies without prompting the owner for permission. So when we go on a website, say for example you go on a site like Zazzle.com, they're going to send a cookie to your hard drive and your computer, unless it's specifically set to prompt you with questions, is just going to accept it. So the big issue is that consumers have to know how to go into their system and change their permissions, keeping in mind that many consumers don't even know what the control panel is. Market forces are demanding this data. There is far too much money to be made by selling consumers information for companies to regulate themselves. Facebook has been lambasted by their consumer base because of all the privacy issues. They have tightened up their privacy policies, but only because people threaten to leave. And again, this is how Facebook makes money. You go on Facebook, you're chatting with your friends, you're posting pictures, you're talking about what you had for dinner that day, but all along the sides there are little advertisements. And now they've even incorporated them into your wall. And they do say advertisement, but oftentimes people will click on something or like it because it'll say, your friend so-and-so like this. However, it is still almost impossible to use Facebook without giving up some rights to your digital footprint just by using certain apps by signing up for certain services, you have to give them your right for certain information about yourself. So Facebook, even though we use it thinking it's free, is actually costing us our privacy. So privacy laws in the United States, not been a good experience. They're usually reactive, meaning they are reacting to a particular situation. And on the next several slides, you'll see exactly why most of these laws were enacted. So the first one we're going to look at is Griswold v. Connecticut. And it has nothing to do with Clark Griswold or the Griswold family vacations. In 1965, in the case Griswold v. Connecticut, the Supreme Court stated that privacy is one of our fundamental rights. The case involved publicly denouncing those who take birth control. Back in the 60s, birth control was pretty um, controversial. It was seen as something that only um, loose women took. So when a married woman gets birth control and the pharmacy was actually publishing lists about it, um, that's when things got real ugly in that case. Then in 1970, we have the Fair Credit Reporting Act and this regulates and restricts disclosures of credit information. It also identified what legitimate uses a credit report can be used for and also identified how a consumer could dispute those reports. Before then, anybody could get access to your credit report as long as they had the information. The other issue is that once something lands on your credit report, even today, 43 years after this law was passed, it is really hard to get anything corrected on your credit report. In 1978, we Congress passed the Right to Financial Privacy Act, which requires a search warrant before banks can divulge the financial data of their clients to federal agencies. And the consumer must also be given the right to be notified and to fight the request if they choose. So if you think about the police being interested in you for whatever reason and they want to see what you're doing with your bank account they have to get a search warrant and you have the right to fight the search warrant before they actually look at your stuff in 1984 the cable communications policy act was passed which prevents cable companies from collecting data about viewing habits of their customers and part of this is do you really want people to know what you're watching at home so 
If you are a big fan of The Real Housewives, do you want your future employer to know that you sit at home in your fuzzy bunny slippers watching The Real Housewives every night? Hmm? Didn't think so. Video Piracy, Privacy Protection Act in 1988 was passed, which bars video rental companies from disclosing the videos its customers watch. And this law was enacted because a cabinet nominee, and that's somebody who works right under the president, um, their watching history was brought forward by the media during his hearing with Congress. They wanted to discuss the movies he was watching. In 1994, Congress passed the Driver's Privacy Protection Act, and this prohibits the release or sale of information that is part of the state's motor vehicle record unless the consumer gives his or her consent. So if I want to find out information about any of my students, I can't go to the motor vehicle um, place and get information anymore. And this was enacted because a young actress, her name was Rebecca Schaefer, you'll see her picture on the left, she was in a little show called My Sister Sam, and she was killed by a stalker, Robert Bardo, who is the man on the right, and he got her information from the California Motor Vehicle Agency. In 1998, and now remember, the internet was commercially became very available in 1995. So now we're beginning to see things that are related to the internet. Congress passed the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, otherwise known as COPA, which forbids websites from collecting personal information from children under the age of 13 without parental consent. Now, up until this year, for those of us who are Facebook um, friends with our youngins, they will tell you that they had to lie and say that their na their age was 13. It changed this year. I, I, I'm not quite sure how they um, filter the 13-year-old, anyone under the age of 13, but essentially that Facebook was not allowing people under 13 um, to have their own account because they don't want to have to not sell the marketing information. <coughs> In 1999, the Financial Services Modernization Act was passed. Primarily, it was a banking bill. However, it did require financial service companies to disclose their information privacy policies once a year in writing. And every year, we get a little envelope with a little piece of paper, and I'm not even kidding you when I tell you it's written in about six-point font. And then it also indicates that we can have an opt-out option. The problem is that most of us, A, don't bother reading these documents, and B, if we do read these documents, they're written in such complicated legal jargon, we're not really sure what they're talking about. So the vast majority of people don't opt out of these kinds of options. In 2001, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act was passed, and this is also known as HIPAA. This law prohibits healthcare providers from disclosing patient information without the patient's consent. So your boss can't call your doctor and say, hey, Jimmy's been out of school for a few days or out of work. What's going on with him? Now they'll say, well, he's sick, but they can't give you any further information. Now, in Europe, things are much different. Um, European countries, especially countries like Germany and Sweden, which are in the northern part of Europe, have been much more proactive in developing protection for their privacy. They see it as a matter of managing data collection, which really, that's what it's all about. And since the 1970s, way before the implementation of commercial internet sites, European countries have restricted data collection and transfer. In 1995, the EU, otherwise known as the European Union, adopted the European Union Directive on Privacy. It requires each member country to enact legislation that protects privacy. In other words, companies cannot collect data about their customers to sell to a third party. So in a nutshell, the European Union has basically said we don't want to get into the business of personalizing advertisements. The last piece we're going to talk about is privacy in the workplace. And this is one of those situations that a lot of people feel is unfair, but the companies themselves 
are the ones who A, believe that it is fair, and B, have the law on their side. So, some employers monitor employee emails, while others observe the movement of employees using video monitoring, as, was, as well as review web surfing activity. So, if you don't want your boss to know that you're on Twitter or Facebook all day, those sites should be closed down. There's also something called an employee internet management software. These tools are referred to as EIM software. And one of the biggies out there is called Silent Manager. And it allows businesses to every, see every keystroke an employee makes at their computer, including deletions. So in this kind of um, picture you see on the right, you can pull up anyone's computer and see exactly what they're doing what they're looking at. You can take a picture of their screen at any point. Employers claim that EMI software, I'm sorry, EIM software, helps them guard their trade secrets as well as prevent abuses of their computer systems. In Europe, employees receive more legal protection for their privacy at work. And really what this boils down to is personal dignity. In Europe, personal dignity is seen as much more important than it is in the United States. In the U.S., the power lies with the corporation, not the person. So, when we look at these kinds of situations, we have to keep in mind that it's not the same in every country. And that means that we have the potential to change. They also have the potential to change. So, as you're thinking about these legal issues, and ethical issues. Also keep in mind of what is next. What is the best option? What is morally or philosophically the right way to keep protection for the company but also protect the employees?